شروم تانک مزلا کوتا ساد مش ناقو عیل کارون آنتا آب عبت نان آب قحزم سعتا آب عبت نان آب قحزم سعتا عرفا کن سینه مسات یک علو صحب خیا جانتا یک علو صحب خیا جانتا یک علو یک علو خوب مدرس ما ای سیما بل کیم زحلای مهلای لحس كيوم سينون قبر اي مسي ومدع عريب ومسحي مسي ومدع عريب ومسحي كم زحج يوم زدني بصحي كم زحج يوم بصحي دمت عيل انت يبس علو حي المجزاتي يبس علو يخطوب علو حي من عساي اركب بوجهنا Back in what are called the base areas, the Eritreans train the next generation of fighters, young recruits who were born into this war and who've never known peace. They learn from childhood that Eritrea is under occupation by the enemy and that the struggle for liberation from Ethiopia is not only a just cause, but a sacred obligation with deep roots in the past long before they were born. Almost 100 years ago, Eritrea was invaded and occupied by the Italians, who superimposed on a rural African society the veneer of a European culture and economy, whose influence gradually seeped into the Eritrean soul. By the outbreak of the Second World War, the Italians had also transformed Eritrea into a military garrison, from which to spearhead Mussolini's dreams of an African empire in all Ethiopia. But that dream was thwarted in 1941, when the British swept into Eritrea and drove the Italians to defeat and surrender. At the end of the war, the British took over the administration of Eritrea in the name of the United Nations, introducing forms of democracy and freedom which remained non-existent in Ethiopia. Eritrea's sense of its own independent and separate identity flourished accordingly. And then came 1952. Haile Selassie, Emperor of Ethiopia, and his Empress leave their palace at Addis Ababa and through the capital streets, packed with people, drive to the old Imperial Palace. Here, a huge crowd waits to hear the official announcement of the Federation of Ethiopia and Eritrea from the Emperor's own lips. Eritrea, an Italian colony conquered by the British, has been under our control for seven years. Now, with the approval of the United Nations, she is united with her neighboring country, Ethiopia. But ten years later, Haile Selassie was to annex Eritrea and turn it into a province of his Ethiopian empire. Rebellion was inevitable, whatever pious hopes the UN might once have held. The emperor, who has done much for the people of his own country, will bring a firm but just rule to the land of Eritrea. By the 1970s, the Eritreans had formed a guerrilla army which was quite capable of launching hit-and-run attacks on the main roads throughout the province. There was a permanent state of emergency. The Ethiopians sent more and more troops to the northern front to destroy the bandits, as they described the rebel army, that now threatened to take over the entire province. In a desperate attempt to preserve the unity of the nation, the army was driven to conscript the Ethiopian peasantry, who now fight to the dubious rallying cry, revolutionary motherland or death. In Eritrea today, at least in the territory held by the rebels, the hours of daylight are silent. Nothing moves. No trucks, no people. Everyone waits, protected by the shadow of the mountains, under the camouflage of thorn trees, waiting for the Ethiopian jets with their bombs and rockets to destroy a rebel base. The planes arrive suddenly and unseen. The target is missed, and at dusk, the routine of wartime life starts up as usual. 
a rebel convoy en route from Sudan carrying supplies for the front or food for the hungry in the zone under their control, moving only by night to avoid Ethiopian aerial bombardment. Lights appear in the side of a mountain that guide you to a mini metropolis half buried in the rock. There you find an operating theatre in the underground casualty wing of the main hospital. The patient was wounded at the front. There's a large piece of shrapnel buried in his thigh which must be removed. The surgeons are all Eritrean. They've been trained in Ethiopia, Europe and America. Like every other member of the EPLF, they work without pay in return only for their food and clothes. The operating theatre runs through the night every night. The carnage of war is never ending. The orthopaedic ward has the grim quality of a field hospital at Passchendaele. Untold thousands of young men who survived the trenches on each side of this war are now crippled beyond repair in the name of Eritrean liberation or the Ethiopian motherland. We have got an aim and objective. Uh, we don't uh, uh, get surprised to see such wounds uh, in such conditions. You get used to it? Yes. We do expect such wounds to happen in such military engagement. Therefore, I don't get surprised, nor uh, I do get afraid of uh, such cases in managing uh, uh, their wound. Many hours away from the hospital, hidden in yet another mountain gorge, are the prisoners of war. Some of the 10,000 which the Eritreans claim to have taken in the last decade. The Ethiopian government does not admit that bandits can take prisoners. So officially, these men have simply ceased to exist. <laughs> Thank you.